Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's my pleasure and a personal privilege to welcome you here tonight to the historic public theatre of Trinity College Dublin on behalf of the Provost John Hegarty. My name is David Lloyd and I'm known to some of you as the Dean of Research for this great university. Tonight I'm going to serve as Master of Ceremonies because I'm the Dean and very briefly I would like to draw your attention to both the location of the exits and a very firm request that everybody would turn off the mobile phones which you're not using to take pictures with. <laughs> I will also be very brief in heaping some appropriate praise on the myriad unsung individuals who have helped make this unreal, real event tonight, including, and not limited to, the fantastic Janet O'Cleary, Quiven O'Loughlin, Simon Williams, Anne Timlin, Daryl Jones, and Jerry Daw. seen myself in one of these before, this is quite a novelty. <laughs> Tonight we gather to mark a very special occasion, indeed it's a joyous occasion which sees our university enriched. It should be noted that you are among a very lucky few. We've never had an event so oversubscribed before, and to those disappointed people watching on podcast only, we're sorry, and next time we will book a stadium. The role of a university in society can be crudely condensed to two things. It's the generation of knowledge and the transfer of that knowledge. There are myriad methods of transfer, graduates, publications, companies, policy supports, public discourse, and lectures like this. A university's true currency are its students and its staff. And they define an institution through their actions and they lay down its heritage for the future world to see. Trinity College Dublin has a very proud literary and cultural heritage. Where else will one find a constellation of stars such as Jonathan Swift, Oscar Wilde, Bram Stoker and Samuel Beckett? Trinity's initiative on the creative arts, technology and culture intends to build on our unrivaled cultural assets, the research strengths that the university enjoys and our propensity for innovation. The CATC initiative gathers scholars and practitioners together with the technology and the arts and creativity in a new way which we intend to redefine Ireland as an international leader in this domain. Promoting the new generation of new ideas, the connectivity across programmes from the arts and sciences and between the city and the university, the CATC spearheads a new appreciation of the creative practice within the university. Our talk tonight is the first of many such events bringing the creative practice to the fore. Sir Terence David John Pratchett embodies creative practice. Over the past 27 years, the Discworld series of novels have entertained, enlightened and enthralled an international readership. The breadth of his productivity spans far beyond that flat world, world atop four elephants, atop a great star turtle. Since his debut novel, The Carpet People, in 1971, which is marginally older than me, Sir Terry has published 49 books and co-authored 50 more. Terry's books have been translated into 38 languages and there are more than 70 million copies in print worldwide. Stage adaptations abound and a very, very deliberate club now. There's a production of Weird Sisters on right now in the Teachers Club on Parnell Square and it runs until Saturday. And I have approved of it. The look of horror. <laughs> Just, just as a note, the look of horror on the cast space yesterday when Terry walked in on the opening night and they weren't quite informed that it was going to happen was priceless. <laughs> Wider audiences have also delighted the television and movie, movie adaptations of his work. And this is knowledge generation and knowledge transfer on a truly global scale. In 2001, Terry won the Carnegie Mod uh, Medal for his children's novel, The Amazing Morris and His Educated Rodents adding to his stock of British science fiction, Locus and Prometheus awards. Only this month, and I know he doesn't like Lifetime Achievement Awards, he was awarded the World Fantasy Lifetime Achievement Award. In 1998, he was named an officer of the Order of the British Empire and received a knighthood in the New Year's Honours List of 2009, both for services to literature. In 2010, Terry was selected to give the BBC Richard Dimbleby Lecture, which he entitled Shaking Hands with Death. 
Terry's stance, his advocacy and his eloquence on this matter are globally renowned. Of course, these awards and these accolades all pale into utter insignificance when compared with the honorary Lit D he was awarded by Trinity College Dublin <laughs> in December 2008. And, of course, the event we're here to witness tonight. Tonight, this privileged audience and the entire internet will hear <laughs> the inaugural lecture of Professor Sir Terry Pratchett, OBE, Blackboard Monitor, adjunct of the Oscar Wilde Centre for Irish Writing and the School of English in Trinity College, Dublin. Drawing on Wilde, Sir Terry's lecture is appropriately entitled The Importance of Being Absolutely Amazed About Everything and will be uniquely delivered with footnotes. <laughs> Back in 1993, Terry spoke to Trinity's Science Fiction Society and in the course of that conversation he observed that he had never analysed his own works. He left it up to you clever buggers at the university to do so. <coughs> Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Terry Pratchett into the fold of clever buggerhood. I would ask you please to be upstanding and applauding for Professor Sir Terry Pratchett. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, distinguished guests, um, I stand before you as your latest and most disreputable professor. <laughs> I'm going to go off message here and just talk to you. I got one A-level, one measly A-level and I taught myself, thanks to Beaconsfield Library. But I'm so pleased to be here today, I cannot say. Uh, my mother was very happy when she was the mother of Sir Terence Pratchett. But as I said before, I think she would be even more proud of my son, the professor. <laughs> Since it was my mother who was possibly the motor of my success, I'll drink a drink to her tonight. Now, it's common knowledge these days, and I know it's common knowledge because I made certain it became common knowledge that I suffer from a, a strange form of Alzheimer's called posterior cortical atrophy. Um, it really means that I cannot deliver a speech as a speech should be delivered. Uh, because uh, delivering a speech means looking at the audience and then looking back at the, uh, at, at the, at the text to find the next line to bore the audience with. <laughs> now, most of you still have a faculty which allows you to do that automatically without thinking about it. I don't, which means unless we want to be here till three o'clock, <laughs> we have to come up with something else. In addition, it was a very, very windy night last night, um, and I didn't sleep very much at all. And PCA means that you have to think about things which normally you don't do automatically, and that also gets in the way. So we put our heads together over a pint <laughs> and, and decided that well, I would introduce um, uh, to the congregation at this point the boy wonder my PA, Rob Wilkins, who will actually do the speech for me while I make faces in the background <laughs> <laughs> and may possibly interject at various points. Um, I, but I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that the speech that he will be delivering uh, rather well, I may say, uh, he's learned from some of the masters. Um, <coughs> 
is the one written by me. Now I'm going to take the back seat a little bit and over to you. Um, Deputy <laughs> I'm not a public speaker, but I'm very close to Terry's words, so I hope that I, well, I hope I do them justice, Get and uh, bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, from the top. And why should I subject you to this charade? It is because it is the truth of the world, and the world is growing older, and I am luckier with my technology than many others. Twice, when I have spoken out on subjects like Alzheimer's and assisted dying, Helpful Christians have told me that I should try considering my affliction as a gift from God. Now, personally, I would have preferred a box of chocolates. <laughs> but nevertheless, there may be some truth, a curiously convoluted truth in that, because it has made me look at the world just like my pants. Now, we've got to step oh. back a bit here, because we have actually jumped forward. You didn't mention your pants. Oh, no. correct. Okay. <laughs> you need to know about, about my pants. <laughs> Sorry about that. You, you knew, I know. He I knew, knew he was we, coming. We would make it. We would mess it up. <laughs> but we mess it up in a hilarious yeah. way. So that's okay. Um, I might need to demonstrate here. <laughs> <laughs> PCA is very strange indeed. Um, it allows me. Uh, what? <clears throat> the example, like all sensible men of my age, I, I indulge in wife lights. Uh, that, that uh, do not deliver that fallout feeling. <laughs> and with PCA, for some reason that I cannot fathom, I cannot tell beforehand whether I'm going to put them on properly or not. Um, and for a long time I had to wrestle with this. And then um, suddenly I realised the solution. If the pants, of course, it's not like the head is where the leg should be or anything like that. It's just which direction they're facing. <laughs> and I spent quite a long time dealing with this affliction until I realised that the solution was staring me in, as it were, to the face. <laughs> if I just lowered my pants gently when they didn't work and then walked in a semicircle around them, <laughs> put them on, from the other side, they will feel uh, miraculously fit. And also, I would have had some healthy exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I, now clear I think we're up on the pants. So I, yeah. I think possibly that my pants are probably finalised at this point, but maybe reintroduced if I think there could possibly be a gag in it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel very humbled that Jonathan Swift actually stood on this stage and actually told us all about his pants as well. So it's, <laughs> and he had very, very long He did, pants. didn't he? <laughs> very strange. And, and he was a big man. They were like double in <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's the end. Anyway, oh right. Anyway. <laughs> Nevertheless, there may be some truth. A curiously convoluted truth in that because it has made me look at the world just like my pants from a new perspective, which according to G.K. Chesterton is the role of fantasy anyway, and now I am living a kind of fantasy. And I have found that growing with me is the steeliness that I never knew was there. The view of the world that might make Bob Dylan look like a man who was only slightly annoyed at the government. <laughs> Whereas not so long ago, I used to drift gently through the world, occasionally rebounding softly from the side. I began to open my eyes, which led to a terrible tendency to question authority. Because authority that cannot be questioned is tyranny. And I will not accept tyranny, any tyranny, even that of heaven. But will certainly make exception for the fully justified and beneficent uh, tyranny of the provost of this institution. <laughs> <laughs> It says here. <laughs> no, no, in the red ink, he, he made me say it. Um, nevertheless, to question authority is not, in principle, to attack it. Although authority always assumes that this is the case, since authority must repeatedly establish its right to rule. And if this is done by force, then it turns out that it was tyranny all along. 
Good heavens, I can't believe I'm preaching this to an audience of Irishmen. Just think, about, after 15 minutes of rational thought, it turns us, well, it turns us both Englishmen. It, turn, it turns an Englishman into an Irishman. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Recently, an organisation not far from where I lived had to make some of its employees redundant. They were called into the office of some functionary who told them that, and I quote, they were being deleted. This did make the local news, but the most miraculous thing about it is that nobody, after being dealt with by a Dalek, punched the bastard's lights out <laughs> and set fire to his desk. <laughs> Terry says he would have stood there bail. Mm. We live in a venal world, run largely by men who count numbers, and because they can count people, they think people are numbers. We accept half-truths, we have learned to think that we must do what the government tells us, when in fact, the truth of the matter is that the government should do what we tell it. Governments are scared. In England, unlike Ireland, where I gather you punch one another's lights out for fun and entertainment at both weddings and funerals, <laughs> The government does not like to hold a referendum because that would mean that stupid people, which is to say people who aren't politicians, would make the decisions which are better left to stupid and, as we learn, more and more dishonest politicians instead. They despise us until an election comes around when they pretend that they do not. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, three peoples who hold dear to them the same God are at one another's throats. How stupid can one species be? And we will continue to be stupid until we realise that the Iron Age is actually over. I write fantasy, and I wouldn't have been able to come up with something like that. It may not surprise you to know that I have some Irishness in my ancestry. But I suspect... <laughs> see? Proof. That was proof, you see. But I suspect that everybody has in the same way that we're all related to Charlemagne. My mother, sadly no longer with us, had an Irish grandfather who told her stories as a girl and took delight in telling me how she passed them on to me when I was very, very young. I was too young, though, to remember, but I sometimes suspect that many of, many of those stories have lurked in, ne in my nether regions of my song <laughs> <laughs> It was in the nether regions of, of my, my subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I cross out pants here then? I'm just going to pants as well. Nothing to do with pants here. Thank you. We're waiting to burst, they were waiting to burst out as soon as, to the dismay of the gods of literature, I got my hands on my first word processor. And I'm pretty certain that one of them surfaced in Lords and Ladies because it had an indefinable Irish feel to it. I owe a great deal to my parents. My mother watched me become a knight, but you know, she would have been even prouder to talk about her son the professor. They raised me with kindness and where appropriate, a side order of brief and effective sternness, and may they be forever blessed with this final consideration without any religious upbringing whatsoever. To the best of my knowledge, neither of my parents as adults ever went into church with a religious forethought. I know that there was a distant Catholicism in my mother's family, but only because once when I was about six years old, I found a crucifix and, much to her amusement, came up to her holding it and said, Mum, I've found a stick with an acrobat on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, al <laughs> and although she did indeed never perform an act of worship that I was aware of, the acrobat followed her every move, every house move, and after her death, I desperately tore my way through her possessions until I found him. He was actually in front of me as I wrote this lecture. I've always considered him an exemplar of mankind, but possibly, regrettably, the origin of species hit me before the Bible. As a child, I did not read for pleasure. Reading was associated with school, and besides, I was always one step behind. A trait that has characterised my life, I feel, starting with the fact that I was born late. It came as a shock, I can tell you, but not so much to my mother, who had been laying there waiting for me for several hours after the apparently predestined time, or three damn hours, as she put it to me later. A few years on, when school days beckoned, the family was still on holiday, and I missed my first day. And the first day, as everybody knows, is the important day. That's where you make your friends and enemies, and more importantly, you get your peg, well, back in those days, with a picture on it, on which a raincoat was going to hang for the next three or four years. The picture was very, very important. 
I might have got the tank. I could have been a contender for the soldier. I wouldn't have even minded the smiley sun and would have been happy with the purple dog. But no, not me. I was left with the two damn cherries. And so I lagged, but you couldn't lag very much with my mum, who taught me to read with love, care and affection, and when that didn't work, bribery. <laughs> and a penny a page per page read perfectly, which subsequently turned out to be a very wise investment on her part, especially when much later they moved into their new house in quite a posh and sought after location. However, she made the mistake of educating me above my age. I recall, because it is in fact tattooed on my psyche, the day in the third or fourth form when the teacher asked us where the rain came from. It so happened that my mum had told me about the water cycles and how seas evaporate gently into the sky and form clouds which are then blown over the land, they get cooled down and the water falls as rain. Of course, all the smart kids, the ones with pegs not marked with soft fruit, had their hands up and were making me miss, me miss noises. But the teacher's eyes lit upon the silly kid, who was the one raising his hand higher than any other child. And upon her surprised nod, I triumphantly shouted out, The sea miss! The result, the jeering of the class, egged on by the teacher, who hadn't even bothered to ask me why I said so. Even as, as a bewildered kid, I was thinking in some kind of terrified puzzlement. Well, surely she can't believe that I don't know that it falls out of the sky. But she asked me where it came from, and I told her the truth. There is a circle of hell for teachers like that, and I tell you what, it's right next to the one set aside for teachers who don't like parents to teach their children to read before they go to school, and one furnace away from people who believe that children should only be given books that are suitable for, the, uh, suitable for them. It isn't big enough, or indeed low enough. I didn't tell my mother, of course, because you never told your mother, just in case you got into more trouble, but something began to seethe and grow. I'm sure of it, but still I pressed on. In my school, staff made the decision when you were six, based on your facility with reading, as to whether or not you would eventually pass the old 11 plus examination, the winners of which would go on to various grammar schools, while the losers went to what were called the secondary moderns, where there was a, where there was a wailing and gnashing of teeth, especially yours. And because, despite my mother's efforts to teach me, <laughs> and because, despite my mother's efforts to teach me to read at all, I didn't pass that test and I was put among the goats rather than the sheep and that was the best thing that ever happened in my education because I was a bright kid, even if a somewhat weird one, and with all the sheep passed with a teacher who would get them through the examination, I, the kid who was always halfway up the class, could suddenly become top with barely an effort and as you know, when you're on top, you really want to stay, oh my god, you really want to stay on top and so for the first time I really worked hard. Around that time, while I was up in London with my parents, an uncle gave me a copy of The Wind in the Willows, and I exploded. I'd never heard of books like this. Books were things that teachers read to you out of, but here was this mole who had a friend who was a rat, who had a friend who was a badger, and they all had a friend who was a toad. Uh, uh, not just any toad, because this toad could drive a car and be mistaken for a washerwoman. <laughs> and, and even I was pretty certain that while a washerwoman probably was not a contender for Miss World, um, she was unlike, unlikely to be mistaken for a toad. I couldn't have expressed my feelings at that point because I didn't have the language for it. But now I would say that I realised with huge delight that the author was doing a number on us, messing with our minds, twisting the world. Where the hell can I get some more, I thought. Incidentally, I remembered while writing this that at the time I was concerned about the horse. Rem remember the horse? Uh, the horse that pulled the canary-coloured caravan in the book. I recall thinking as a child that all these animals can speak and don't have to go to work for a living like my dad. Whereas the cart horse does all the work all the time and doesn't have a voice. The momentary feeling I had then was pure socialism. <laughs> <laughs> and that is how I became a Saturday boy at the local public library, feverishly writing out another library ticket to myself every time there was a book I really wanted to read. And I read everything. There was a sort of chain reaction. One book sends you on to another, and I read it, and went on to the next without order, method, or any plan, except possibly to read them all. And so I was reading Mayhew's London Labour and the London Poor at the same time as I was reading Torve Janssen's. Torve Janssen's. Thank you. <laughs> Moving Troll books. And reading both these books in the same, as it were, mental tone of voice. St some stuff I thought was rubbish, and probably was, but patterns emerged. 
taking down a book on the Silk Road simply because it sounded interesting channeled me onto the history that we didn't learn at school. Not because the teachers were bad, but because nobody had really thought about what education should be. I remember learning in school about the Corn Laws, but only vaguely remember what they were. But I remember that they were a government cock-up to, to the detriment of the poor. Uh, so, no change there then. <laughs> <laughs> but the real history, the history that everyone should know, the beginnings of the earth, the dance of the continents, the journey of mankind, the development of science, these took little space on the curriculum, but thankfully they were in abundance in the library. God bless it. For me, my education in the library was like putting together a great big jigsaw puzzle of science fiction, history and paleontology. I read up on them as if they were all part of the same thing, which, in a holistic kind of way, uh, they certainly were. Another breakthrough came when I discovered second-hand bookshops around about the age of 12. There were the books that no longer turned up on the library shelves, my local library in Beaconsfield being a spanking new library with spanking new books. But my dad told me there was a second-hand bookshop in the village of Penn, a short cycle ride away, although a difficult cycle ride when you're coming back with two creaking carrier bags full of books hanging from your handlebars. It was a wonderful bookshop. It was where I learned humour. I did this the easy way, although the easy way is not often easy at all. I read for pleasure every bound copy of the magazine Punch between 1840 and the mid-1960s. Why? Well, not to get a masterclass in humorous writing, but for fun. However, a masterclass was what I got because I read the best satirists and comic writers of a whole century, including Mark Twain and Jerome K. Jerome, whose laconic styles, it seemed to me, bore a similarity, even though they were a notion apart. Jeffrey Willans and Ronald Searle delighted me by producing the Molesworth series. You know that? The, the very best schoolboy humour, uh, with the books Down With School, Whiz For Atoms, How To Be Top, and Back In The Jug Again. And then I began to absorb the columnists like Beachcomber, Patrick Campbell, Robert Robinson, and not least, certainly not least, Alan Corran, possibly, as far as observational humour is concerned, the king of them all. I read all of these when I, was, when I was, by the standards of the late 50s, still a child. But in doing so, for sheer pleasure, I was pressing my foot hard down on the growing up button. I found humour has to be topical, and so while reading these musty tomes of punch, I picked up by osmosis the topics, concerns, and even the speech patterns of the millennia. Which is money in the bank for a writer. I wasn't looking for ideas, techniques, or that terrible word, tips. I simply absorbed. Writers probably all do this in their separate ways because it is hard to imagine an author who is not a reader first. I was astonished at the wealth laid out for me. I was learning from the masters and I thought about what I learned. In fact, I did not know it at the time, but a, a satanic mill had started turning in my head and eventually it would turn out a writer, but like every mill, it needed grist. If you don't know what grist is, by the way, uh, look it up, it says here, because you're all academics, so there you are. <laughs> that is a footnote. I was particularly impressed by Alan Corrin's grasp of the vocabulary of the average bewildered Englishman, but especially of what we used to call the working class. I know this because my London granny used to take me around the street markets and every single barker and shill and trader and hard bargainer, bus conductor, well, and, and, and even my grandmother used a dialogue by Corrin. He really was a wonderful man. I remember having a cheerful argument with my mum after my London granny told me that you could tell where a bus was going to because of the name on the front. My mother had taught me about the Greek myths and had mentioned the first marathon run by Pheidippides. He ran from Marathon to Athens. Uh, well, as every schoolboy knows, or well, they, they used think, to. As they used to know when schoolboys used to know things. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember discussing this with Mum, uh, and the valid point that since he was running to Athens, he was really running an Athens rather than a marathon because, quite certainly, this would have been the case had he had been employed by London Transport. <laughs> a point which my mother graciously took without giving me a clip round the ear. In accordance with the Satanic Mills, the Satanic Mills' plans to make certain that I was constantly being surprised, the calendar that my mother and father, both, both working people, had to follow for their summer holidays meant that I also arrived at my secondary school. Yes, one day late. And that's the day, if you remember, and have been paying attention, uh, they tell you everything that's important. It's no good coming in on the second day because the second day is not the first day and of course that's the day when you learn the things that you learn on the second day. And once again, the feeling that I had that everybody knows something that I don't reinforced my air, if air can be reinforced, 
of astonishment. Obviously, on that first day, the secret of algebra had been disseminated. <laughs> Later on, I would dream that I might understand algebra and have mastery of the world. But 10 years ago, my good friend Ian Stewart, professor of maths at Warwick, sat down with me after a university dinner and scrawled all over the napkins the sheer and obvious understandability of the basics of the quadratic equation with sweat beading on his brow, to which I sadly reacted with, with the philosophical equivalent of the word, duh. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry actually had to uh, teach his speech engine how to understand the word, duh. And as he says, <laughs> you know, yes, I had to teach a computer to be dumb, a project for a rainy afternoon. <laughs> and so, once again, I settled down to being halfway down the class, doing enough schoolwork to survive, and no more. My true education still coming by the library, and amazingly, from the science fiction books, I was still consuming like sweets. Bliss. Would you like this one? <laughs> Bliss it was in that space age born to be alive. Sorry, there's so many things around here I can't read. Something that's kind of. I'm ready for my big memory. Oh, I see. Bliss it was in that space age dawn to be alive. But unfortunately, my only reliable source of first, first class, second hand American science fiction magazines was called The Little Library. And it was in a shack in Frogmore, a tiny part of High Wycombe, in which a very nice elderly lady dispensed cheer, the occasional cup of tea, and pornography. <laughs> <laughs> However, in order to justify the name, and presumably to have somewhere she could put in the window... Something. Something. Um, she also sold decent SF and fantasy from second-hand cardboard boxes below the, uh, how shall we put it, the uh, pinker shelves? Uh, which were not, at that time, of any particular attraction to me. How could you turn your eyes upwards when there was a Brian Aldiss you hadn't read yet, and something by Harry Harrison, and the third book in James Blish's Cities in Flight trilogy? I consumed and I became such a habitué that I was guaranteed a cup of tea twice every week, after which I would leave with my satchel bulging, possibly to the bewilderment of the regular bystander, who might have been unaware of the SF booty I called my own. <laughs> I, I recall scrabbling around happily one day after school when the door was abruptly pushed open and in came a man who, the, by the look of his efforts not to look like one, was clearly, even to me, a plainclothes policeman. He pointed angrily at me and demanded of my hostess, who was a dear old soul, what's he doing in here? Gleefully, she brandished a copy of Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land, which I certainly was, and said, and I note here, Oni swa imali ponce, Jeffrey. Which astonishingly, he didn't understand. <laughs> But he seemed to accept. And um, for those of you with little Latin, it broadly translates as He who sees any evil in this is a ponce Jeffrey. <laughs> Game set a match to her, I fancy. And she was a decent soul, a nice friend to this kid that she considered was her only legitimate customer. She never encouraged me to become a patron of the Pinker Shells, nor did she offer me any of the slim envelopes which, when she thought I wasn't looking, she handed to the serious and somewhat furtive connoisseurs of the dirty raincoat persuasion, who were always embarrassed by my presence. I think at the time, I thought they were probably con they probably contained mint condition and therefore expensive. Or high people like Moorcock and Ballard. <laughs> <laughs> That's high class, that is. Um, she was a widow, and I don't think I ever knew her name. In a way, she was one of my tutors because the growth of the author, as the Dark Mill knows, requires many varieties of compost. And I needed that because I wasn't working at school and school wasn't working for me. It was a decent school. The teachers were the usual bunch, at least in those days, of enthusiasts for their subject, some who could inspire. The what? No, good. I a good joke that I thought we may have missed. <laughs> We're only halfway through. <laughs> it was a decent school. The teachers were the usual bunch, at least in those days. An enthusiast for the subject, some who could, could inspire, relics of the war, the needlessly sarcastic, and of course, the madman. Uh, the latter, a general favourite with every boy in the school. 
My fellow pupils too were also from central casting, most with their eyes firmly on their A-levels and a good job. A few who shouldn't really have been there, and, and the bully and the weird kid and the troublemaker, which was me. It was the worst times and it was the... Uh... No, yeah, stick while you're ahead. Okay, it okay. was the worst times. It was the worst times. Because I was the troublemaker. Picture the scene. The 1960s were moving sluggishly into High Wycombe. And regrettably, my headmaster considered himself a stalwart against 60s behaviour. As a matter of fact, mostly the kids really just wanted to get their qualifications, just as I did. But when I brought in a copy of Mad Magazine, I was apparently a bad influence. Me, the kid who would spend so much time in the library that he would have to blink before he could get used to daylight again. I was astonished, and I have to say that Mad Magazine in those days did some remarkably well-observed parodies of Broadway shows, often with a soupçon of harmless political humour and downright comic book fun. But to the headmaster, it, it appeared to be the harbinger of the breakdown of society, and indeed his society was under threat. But I just liked the magazine, and then on another occasion I was caught with a copy of Private Eye, apparently another crime against society. In fact, I was an amiable, if somewhat talkative kid who liked reading anything and didn't even own a Bob Dylan record, making me possibly unique amongst my peers. In truth, Harry Ward was probably a good teacher. Although I don't think he was a good headmaster, or at least one who understood that adolescents were going to be, well, adolescents, and very few of us were really any kind of a problem. We actually carried a knife, a pen knife, much better than a pencil sharpener if you had to, as we did that back then, lots of technical drawing. I can only recall one occasion when one was actually proffered in a fight, and that was by the weird kid who left shortly afterwards. But Harry made the classic mistake of the tyrant, seeing rebellion in the most innocent transgression, and the transgression in the most innocent activity, or none at all. And I recall a boy I shall call Charles, who had the misfortune to be born with, the amiable with an amiable disposition, and a face which automatically composed itself into a cheerful grin. Its only other expression, as I recall, was a mild kind of sullen puzzlement when a cheerful grin got him into trouble. And so the suspicious atmosphere of the school meant that he was either seen as a clown or exhibiting dumb insolence, the influence of Harry got him coming and going. As a natural idiot, I was also in permanent trouble with the bully because I preferred to use my voice in an argument and he preferred to use his fists. But a friend of mine from those days gleefully recalled to me the day when I lost my rag and ran at the kid down the length of the room, hitting him in midship so hard that he went down and cut his head open on the fireplace. After that, I became apparently invisible to him. And it really wasn't any trouble. The schoolboy code was that... Short of murder, you left authority out of it. Recently, a fellow pupil from those days told me that long after I had left, uh, and much earlier than expected, he spoke as the sixth former with the headmaster and learned that the man had been affected by the dreadful scenes he had witnessed during the Second World War and was sure that this contributed to the man's itchy trigger finger. But I can't say. But knowing now the theatres that he had been in, I can sympathise. But how could I have done so then? Besides, I was at worst a clown, and by heavy-handedness, the man created what had not been there in the first place. But I thank him in absentia for firming up my decision to quit school before taking my A-levels, a previously unthinkable occurrence. I knew I wanted to be a writer. I had won a prize in, punch mag in, uh, in a punch competition and sold two short stories to science fiction magazines. But being the son of my parents, I researched and realised that the odds of making a living as a writer were, for practical purposes, zero. Whereas a newspaper journalist gets paid every week. Well, still at school and lined up for the head librarianship, I wrote to the editor of the local newspaper, the Bucks Free Press, asking if there was likely to be a vacancy the following year. And he wrote back instantly saying, I don't know about next year, but we have a vacancy right now. Thanks to Harry Ward, I went to see him on the following Saturday and on the Monday, walked into school and handed back all my school books and left by the door that could only be used by prefects and visitors. <laughs> a delightful sensation. The school could be a petty place, and in my decision, it was prompted by the knowledge that Harry was publicly adamant that I could not have had the prefectship that traditionally went with being the head librarian. I learned this by nefarious means. I had been spending every Thursday evening tidying up the library and, re and repairing the books, and this was an act of malice, sheer malice. Having been a prefect looks good on your CV and might have come in useful. 
On the other hand, Arthur Church, editor of the Free Press, gave me the job right there in the interview. In recollection, he said, I like the cut of your jib, young man. Did he really say that? It would have been in his character, but remember, my subconscious is that of an author and a former journalist and probably believes that every quote would benefit from a bit of a polish by an expert. <laughs> and as I believe Douglas Adams once said, sometimes after talking about, about yourself so often, you're not exactly sure how real some things are. The conditions of a trainee newspaper reporter in the mid-60s were somewhere just above slavery. You could live at home and not be beaten with chains. On several occasions I worked every day of the week, including most evenings and certainly Saturdays, especially in the summer, and they were seldom my own. There was a mystical beast known as the day off in lieu, but it was seldom seen until much later in my career. I was an apprentice, a genuine apprentice. My father even had to sign a copy of my indentures, a medieval looking document which basically meant that I sold my soul for three years, in return for which you were taught the rudiments, tricks, dirty jokes, suspicious folklore, and cliches of local newspaper journalism. If Johnny Howe was your sub-editor, you got all the jokes, dirty jokes, quickly, because Johnny was blessed with a wonderfully dirty mind. He needed, he needed it, oh yes indeed, because a sub-editor on a local newspaper at least needs a pin-sharp apprehension for every inadvertent doubler on Tondra. Did a correspondence once send in a report about a women's institute flower, fruit and vegetable show and actually include the bit about the naked man streak, streaking through the marquee causing disarray among the tarts before he was caught by the gooseberries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Johnny, the spit and image of the late Stubby K, looked me firmly and trustingly in the eye and almost certainly, I suspect, lied. Any writer needs an eye for the doubler entendre in the same way that a gamekeeper has to have the mind of a poacher. The deliberate doubler entendre, on the other hand, is not to be sneezed at. I myself once perpetrated a treble entendre, and I suspect that if sufficient grant money could be made available, the quadruple entendre should not be beyond our power. It's a bold statement, isn't it? Um, if Johnny was short and fat, Ken Burroughs, called Bugsy behind his back, was the saturnine news editor, tall and thin, and when the two of them headed off down the pub at lunchtime, it looked like the number 10 going for a walk. <laughs> he taught me to get my copy in on time, check my facts, and never try to put one over on him. George Topley, chief reporter, and the best natural journalist I've ever met, taught me the uses of the truth and some useful secrets about human nature. And finally, Arthur Church, local boy, editor of the local paper who took the affairs of High Wycombe very seriously and taught me honesty and self-respect and not, if at all possible, to offend the Methodists. A decent man. The 60s were puzzling him in the same way as they did my recent headmaster, but the 60s were okay with Arthur, provided that they included High Wycombe. When the first Apollo mission to the moon sent back those glorious pictures of Earth seen from its satellite, Westminster Press, the owners of the paper, got hold of some of those and looked around desperately on one Thursday to see which of their papers had colour capability and was going to press soonest, and how they must have groaned when they worked out that somebody was going to have to ring up Arthur Church and tell him to clear the front page and at least two others. Probably the chiefs tossed a coin, but us reporters listening at his office door heard his agonised voice as he defended the interests of High Wycombe against those of the universe. <laughs> and he had a point. Every national newspaper the next day would carry pictures of the moon, but only one newspaper would carry the affairs, the important affairs of High Wycombe. Not to mention Marlowe, Lacey Green, Lucy Rowe, West Wycombe and Speen. It was, it was a Chestonian moment, and there was no doubt that he was right. But although they were asking, he recognised an order in disguise after a fairly lengthy tussle. And we set to work clearing the decks while he walked about grumbling, very nearly in tears. After all, the moon was just a lump of rock, right? And then, suddenly, the issue was happily resolved in his mind as he beamed and he said with good grace, well, I suppose the moon shines on High Wycombe too, just like everywhere else. And we nearly cheered. <laughs> Next day, the Bucks Free Press sold out within minutes, uh, even in Spain, and Arthur's phone was constantly ringing off the hook because local dignitaries were ringing up to congratulate him on his wonderful coup. High Wycombe had approved. He very nearly bought us all a drink. The editor editors of local newspapers were, and probably still are, insofar as they still exist, many haven't given way 
to the useless and, sus and suspect local government information sheets have been accused of parochialism. But a sense of the parochial is needed for the job. Everybody in the world knows how jo John F. Kennedy died. Somewhat fewer would want to know about the death of some luckless citizen found dead in his car in his garage with a pipe from the exhaust through a partly open window. Murder? Probably not. Suicide? Quite likely. But their town or neighbourhood should know the truth, and in those days it was conveyed to them by me and others like me, because I had sat there glumly in the coroner's court, taking down the facts of the matter, as deduced by the coroner, in reasonably good pigments. We did not like to do it. People find many and varied ways to end their lives abruptly, and all of them are nasty, especially for those who have to deal with the aftermath, especially because suicide really needs practice. And there lies the problem. Pierpoint, the executioner, knew how to hang a man swiftly, and he knew how long the rope should be and where on the neck the knot should be to ensure the merciful end. And most people don't. And one day, the relative of a particularly gruesome suicide asked the coroner to tell the newspapers not to publish the findings of his inquest. He said, quite correctly, that we were entitled to be there by law and all would have been well had he not added something along the lines of, although I sim and along the lines of, Although I sympathise with you, and sometimes I myself have wished the press was at the bottom of the sea. Of course, we published that, and Arthur Church, who took local journalism very seriously, wrote an eloquent defence of reporting even the nasty things. The gist of it was this, that it was in the public interest that the truth be known, and known because it has been carefully reported and published. Without it, you're relying on the man in the pub, the rumour, and possibly malicious rumour, for your information. The local paper does, for some reason, get it wrong. Then, if it did get it wrong, then this would be known, and an apology and clarification would be made. This was not the best of all worlds, but better than the world of hearsay. Arthur laid this out very carefully, and the coroner instantly apologised, handsomely, and Honour was satisfied once again. Arthur was a stickler for accuracy, and it was not a good day when some angry citizen came up the stairs on a Saturday to complain about some item, at least if it truly turned out that the luckless reporter had got something wrong. If this investigation showed that the reporter was accurate, the, the aggrieved reader was courteously shown the door. And it wasn't only the coroner's courts I had to cover. Along with the other trainees, I travelled on a number of treacherous motorcycles to cover every possible civic event in the area, including the magistrate's court, where I learned a lifelong cynicism of the process of the justice system. And regrettably, I also learned that elderly ladies are sometimes inacceptably fond of wearing directoire knickers. A blue one. <laughs> The tutor in this case being a magistrate, a lady of the shires who liked to sit with legs akimbo, possibly without realising there was no modesty panel. I sometimes wonder now if she was ever puzzled why people never looked directly at her. Indeed on, <laughs> indeed, on occasion it seemed to me that every man in the courtroom was staring at his shoes, and that included the lawyers. Often I have been contacted by internet journalists for an interview or some extended comment, and the moment they say that they are journalists, I say, good, tell me the six defences for defamation of character. I am slightly cheered these days when I know, uh, these days, that some know what, I, what I'm talking about. I'm still quite proud of my Pitmans and my indenture. I was a decent local journalist and well informed and accurate to boot, but when it came to the hurly-burly of the large regional or national newspaper, I just wasn't in contention. I just didn't have the killer instinct, and as e uh, editor Eric Price perceived when he sacked me from the Western Daily Press in Bristol, he was not a happy man if the story discovered was not the story that he wanted, and indeed the Western Daily Press appeared regularly on the CVs of many a young journalist that Eric had hired and fired. On the other hand, he was kind enough to say, much later, that I had been the best writer that they had had. Possibly that was true, because I did have, and hopefully still have, the ability to somehow apprehend a topic and write coherent, inform, informed and readable column about it within half an hour, possibly with the help of one telephone call and a newspaper clipping. Why am I telling you these disjointed anecdotes? I suppose that it shows how an author is built. Quite a lot of my history found itself scrubbed up, repainted, and part of the book. I'm pretty certain, for example, that a keen, clever, academic bugger 
could map the wizards of my unseen university against the staff of High Wycombe Technical High School from the late 50s onwards, and not all of them got eaten by dragons. Indeed, some of them, including my head of history, who I really liked, have been immortalised in print. In the scenery of, my, scenery of my books, I see the little village where I grew up. Characters speak who remind me of my grandmother, and it seems that the mill fondly grinds up every experience, every encounter, and never, ever switches off. And sometimes I detect the influence of my tutors, even if they didn't know who they were. Nevertheless, the grinding mill always gives something back. A few days before I wrote this piece, a friend recounted to me that she had met a brigadier who had discovered the Discworld books in Afghanistan, several in a neat pile. I know about this sort of thing. Quite often a squaddy will, will make contact with me, saying, we get told to shift immediately and leave everything inessential, and regrettably it turns out that reading matter counts as non-essential. But the brigad brigadier, taking cover, picked up one of the books and became hooked, I'm pleased to say. But he said to her, how does he do it? He hasn't been a soldier. A monstrous regiment was written by somebody with a deep knowledge of the military. Stuff you don't get out of books. So how does he do it? Well, I think I know, because I believe it is the same little discovery which allowed me to win the Amelia Bloomer Award for Feminist Writing in the USA. Twice. <laughs> I don't need to explain, because a little thought will bring up the answer, and that is an author learns to understand the commonality of mankind, and if you care enough and know enough about people, you can work out, to your satisfaction, how they will deal with a particular pressure and situation, and from this observation can come a spurious rep uh, reputation. And by the way, it also works if the people are trolls. For the whole of my life, since I was nine years old, I've enjoyed words not necessarily words organised, simply some words all by themselves, such as conundrum, extemporaneous, onomat onomatopoeia, and susurration, words that somehow seem to speak back. I care for words and their meanings, and sometimes stick up for them in a way that the blessed Lynn Trust would understand, like screaming at the local news on the television. If a policeman said how he saw the suspect, then he is either describing the position he took in order to observe, or he was giving a brev very brief lecture on optics. <laughs> the word he actually wanted was that. Pedantic? Well, well, I am an academic now. And besides, the argument that such, bothering, <laughs> that such bothering about matters of usage is elitist, a view espoused by Stephen Fry, a man with elite written all over him, is a load of dingo's kidneys. Wouldn't you expect a lover of music to wince at a wrong note? Work it out yourself. Words turn us from monkeys into men. We make them, change, uh, change them, chase them around, we eat them and live by them. They are the workhorses, carrying any burden, and their usage is the skill of the author's trade. And it's hugely versatile. There are times when the wrong word is the right word, and times when words can be manipulated so that silence shouts. Their care, feeding, and indeed breeding is part of the craft of which I am a journeyman. I will finish by leaving you with a word that I would like to see totally expunged from the English language. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I suggest you let fun out of your life. <laughs> <laughs> For it is, brothers and sisters, a mongrel word, an ersatz word, a fast food bucket of a word. What Hallelujah! <laughs> what does it mean? Consider the shameful usage. Oh, I was doing it for a bit of fun. Oh, I thought it would be fun. I was only having fun. And worst of all, the little bit of white on the top of this chicken, dr chicken dropping is, are we having fun yet? Yeah. Why have fun when you could have enjoyment, amusement, entertainment, diversion, relaxation, sport, a bit of a lark? and satisfaction, and probably contentment. Fun pretends to be about enjoyment, but is merely about the attempt. In search of fun, people pull themselves towards places that advertise fun, but they're probably to be avoided, since in my recollection, fun means trudging around a soaking wet seaside town wearing plastic raincoats that no matter what you do, always smell of fish. <laughs> All right, maybe I'm only having a bit of fun with you. But these islands of ours have the richest language in the world, most, mostly because we stole useful words from everybody else, besides frantically inventing new ones ourselves. So let's have fun with it. You never know. 
It might just be fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all you. And since that time, it's been my privilege uh, to occasionally call on Terry's uh, telephone at home to ask him to do various things, to come to dinners and to come and accept mm -hmm. honorary degrees and to do various bits of pieces and to become a professor. And uh, when I called the house last time, it was to ask if he would consider becoming an adjunct professor in this university. And the term I used was, do you fancy being a chair? <laughs> To which he replied, is there any hat associated with this position? <laughs> there is a hat associated with this position. We have had a hat commissioned for your professorship by uh, a commissioner no less than John Rosha, who cannot be with us tonight, but the hat can. <laughs> so, Professor Pratchett, uh, sir, it gives me great pleasure to present to you these <laughs> note blooms. Yes. Very, you, you, I find it was very down. Do you feel like it? I don't know what to say. I know an event like this looks as if it's just been thrown together in five minutes, and well, it, it was. Um, <laughs> but um, David actually does quite a lot of work. I know his team hello, um, do an awful lot more work than <laughs> entirely true. But he's the man standing next to me, so um, we'd just like to give you a little something to say thank you. To a token of our appreciation, just a, a, little, a little book you might have already read, but there you go. So, so, no, thank you very much. The final thing is. is uh, yeah, that, I, my, oh, you've got one. Over to you. It's my job saying what the final <laughs> thing is. <laughs> what, what was your final thing? This. The words. The words. Give me the only words. copy of the words. Oh, there they are. Well, give him the only copy of the words. Oh, no, no, we're going to give a copy of the words to somebody here. Oh, mm. right. You could give it away no, when there's we eBay don't out it. there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so maybe not the final thing, because Terry will say the final thing, but we've got the words here that, um, that we scrawled out for tonight. Um, if anybody wants them and wants to make a donation to charity, um, there's no formal way of doing this. Um, just someone yell out some figure, and whoever yells out the biggest one gets it. It's, <laughs> it's just got to be that way. So does anybody want it? Terry will autograph it. 
two euros. <laughs> <laughs> it's be a <laughs> Does anybody want it? If anybody wants it, yell, just yell out how much. Okay, let's, let's go to 500 euros. <laughs> Who's still in at 500 euro, euros? We've got 100 euro bill up here. Who would go higher than 100? I'll give you 500. 500? Can you afford 500? Have you got good credit? <laughs> <laughs> Will you, um... Then come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 